Coming up on Mississippi Roads, we visit a light photographer. Spend some time with Paul LeBartard as he shows how he makes his famous knives and some incredible eggs. All that coming up now on Mississippi Roads. Down Mississippi Roads. Hi, welcome to Mississippi Roads. I'm your host, Walt Grayson. This week, we're coming to you from the Alice Mosley Folk Art and Antique Museum. It's housed in the old train depot in downtown Bay St. Louis. And the reason we're here is this entire show is about people who have transformed their passion into art, which is exactly what Miss Alice did. And there are lots of examples of her work upstairs. We're going to be going inside in just a few minutes. But first, we had a chance to talk to Alice Mosley's son, Tim, here a while back. And Tim told us a good little bit about his mom and about her art. Well, my mom uh, started painting when she was 65. Her mother came to visit, to live with her from Birmingham, Alabama and had Alzheimer's. And that's a very difficult task to take care of someone in that condition and my mom always said she started painting to kind of keep her sanity. So she was basically untrained as an artist. She didn't believe in painting things that weren't a story. She believed, you know, she wasn't a purist that would paint a tree and just expect people to say that's such a beautifully painted tree. She wanted something going on with a tree. She's got a little whimsical painting here, wild cherries for the birds. And the story is that the cherries were fermenting and blue jays kept on eating all those cherries and one of them passed out drunk down at the bottom of the painting. So my mom liked to see a sense of humor in nature. Another painting of hers that's very popular, my daddy's bird dog Joe died. And when he died, mom started painting him. And he got up to, Joe got up to heaven and he get, they got an intersection and this way for folks heaven and this was pet heaven. And they made Joe go to pet heaven. And the title is, until today, I thought I was folks. And Joe thought he was folks. And now that my mom's gotten to heaven, I'm sure Joe and mom are either in pet heaven or folk heaven, but they aren't gonna be in separate heavens, I don't think. My mom had a gigantic imagination. Well, my mom and I had been talking about having a museum uh, before she died. Mom always wanted the museum to be free so people could come whether they had money or didn't have money. She just wanted people to be able to enjoy her art. We started out in the, her blue house uh, right after she died. She died in 04, and we uh, had the museum. When Katrina hit in 05, we had the museum in her house. We were very lucky out of all of Bay St. Louis, her house got six inches of water in Katrina. We came back after Katrina there was one wet spot in the ceiling and all of her art was still hanging where we left it. So it was just kind of a magical thing because most of Bay St. Louis was wiped out in Katrina. Alice Mosley left this life very happy, especially with the last 15 years of her life. When she got to Bay St. Louis, there was very little art there were very few artists in Bay St. Louis, but Alice had a big part in making it popular in Bay St. Louis. People used to bring their mothers and fathers to see my mom, and they always wanted to make the point, see, she's 94 years old, uh, was an inspiration to people her age, that you're never too old to do whatever you want to do. Well, as an idyllic folk artist, Alice Mosley didn't conform to the formal rules of art, or reality either for that matter. So she would really have appreciated this next young man, T.J. Legler, who also ignores the rules of reality and uses modern technology and media 
and paints with light. Truly, I started dabbling in it about two and a half years ago um, in the true sense of photography, other than just pointing, clicking, and shooting. That's when I really started learning the true schematics of using manual and long exposure and uh, just getting into the more fine details of making the image your own versus, say, pointing, having the camera do everything for you, making it to where you manipulate it in your own way and you own the image. A lot of people, um, when they see my long exposures and light paintings, they think it's a form of Photoshop that somehow I've superimposed this background onto this image in order to create this effect. Truth be told, this is a form of long exposure in what's called light painting photography. I like to shoot in a lot of abandoned places. Uh, I also like to shoot in a lot of country places, too. Places that have as little light pollution as possible are prime because um, in this art form, I mean, darkness is your canvas. The more darkness that you have, the better a canvas that you are working with. Um, and light is literally your paint. You know, you wouldn't start an actual painting with a canvas that was, say, a bit torn, already had some paint blobs on it. So darkness is the most important thing that you're searching for when doing light painting photography. We're gonna experiment. First time I've ever mixed fiber optic with a lightsaber. Should be fun, right? As you can see here, this is the image sent directly from the camera. We did need to make a few adjustments, but in the end, it turned out really cool. You can see we got the spiral down with the lightsaber. You can see the outside of the orb. And then we have the interior there with fiber optic. The one thing is we had a little bit of light interference with daylight being outside and right there and there. But otherwise, this is gonna be a purely dark place. Um, it would have worked fine, no problems whatsoever. I'm actually part of an international group called the Light Painting World Alliance. You speak online, this is how I found out about this originally because I remember I was on a trip about three years ago and one thing I would always do as a photographer was look and see what people were taking pictures of and I saw these glowing orange spheres that had all of these sort of hairs coming off in all directions off as like how did they do that? And I looked it up and they were actually lighting steel wool on fire and spinning it around, which uh, for most people who consider themselves light painters is the entry point, um, spinning steel wool around. But from there, you know, I use um, keywords online going through Google and then further into YouTube, just researching these things until I understood the concept. You know, I can't just find somebody on the street here in Jackson and be like, hey, um, tell me about your light paintings lately. You know, it's it's a very difficult thing to do um, because not a lot of people really understand this art form. Right now we're just scouting the location. Um, I can see a live feed of what the drone is filming right now on my phone. We're just gonna go over where we're gonna be shooting later. It's just underneath the Natchez Trace. Um, it's a little bridge tunnel. It leads to part of the hiking trail. All right, let's take a walk through the woods, shall we? Today, you'll notice I brought my girlfriend, Sarah, with me. She joins me in a lot of my adventures. We're going along this part of the Natchez Trace and we're gonna see what we can get into, go to this graffiti tunnel. So here, we're just gonna kill some time, wait for the horizon to kind of go down a little bit and all the colors come out and then once it's done, we'll know it's time to start light painting. That's when the real fun will begin. But a lot of it's just patience and waiting. That's pretty neat. 
The most important thing with light painting is preparation, so it involves a lot of scouting. Um, what we're going to do now, since there's still a little bit of daylight left, we're going to head to the site, we're going to position where the tripod's going to be later, we're going to get set up where I want to be in the shots, so I'm going to be doing the light painting itself. Decide which lens we want, do we want one that's a bit closer up, a bit more portrait mode, do we want something that's a bit further out, more landscape. So it's all in the preparation and the devil's in the details. Well, this is my studio. Top place in the Jackson metro area. I've got to say, we've got the finest interior design. What more could you want? So those last little golden rays are disappearing now and the clouds are going to turn blue. I'm ready. Wow, oh, that's a keeper. You got some finger lights. Um, these are just a bulk kind of child's play item, but you can see they're pretty bright, uh, which is important for light painting. This is very free form. Whenever I'm out in the field, I like to go buck wild and crazy as all get out, and yeah. I don't know what on earth this is. We're gonna find out. This is titanium. It's like magic. I mean, that's one thing that uh, I, I know all artists strive to have is that magic, that feeling that gets you just so satisfied. Uh, and this does it for me. The ultimate thing is to have fun with this. And if you're not having fun with it, then why do it? You'll find plenty of Alice Mosley's folk art on display here at her folk art museum in Bay St. Louis. She can make folk art out of anything. She even painted on a handsaw one time. She may not be as famous as Grandma Moses, but around here, Alice Mosley is folk art royalty. And I'll tell you somebody else who's royalty in his field, just to the east of here, and that's master knife maker, Paul Labata. Now, if you know anything about the art of knife making, then you know Paul Labata. What boy doesn't like knives, you know, especially growing up in the country where you build your forts and, and uh, you're hunting and fishing and all that. When I first started making knives, uh, I just, all I had was a washing machine motor and a, and a Black & Decker hand drill and a lot of elbow grease, a lot of sandpaper and files. I think what got me started, I read a magazine article about making a knife and picked up an old broken hacksaw blade and uh, ground sort of a fillet knife out. In fact, I've got one here that I, I made, uh, one of the very first ones like that. And somebody saw it and wanted to buy it. And I said, well, sure. So I sold it to him, I think for $8. So I picked up another blade, made another knife and. Somebody bought it, so next thing you know, I'm a, I'm a part-time knife maker. And everything that I make has my name on it there. And maybe you can call it uh, buying a little immortality, because 100 years from now, whenever I'm dead and gone, that knife will still be out there, and to still have my name, Labata, wrote on that knife. And folks will still be using it and enjoying it. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Okay, name on, the, on this side. Well, a knife is primarily a tool. Uh, it's probably the oldest tool uh, in, in existence. Uh, some of them are designed to uh, skin animals. Some of them are designed to clean fish. Uh, some are designed to cut up vegetables in the kitchen. Some are designed to chop trees and stuff. And some are designed for soldiers to take into uh, harm's way. But every knife is designed for a certain purpose there. The people that buy my knives now are mostly people that already own my knives. They buy more and more of them. Uh, I don't really advertise, but uh, there have been magazine articles uh, written about me, and that generates sales. I am a member of the Knife Makers Guild, which is a very elite fraternity. It's a jury type thing. You have to apply for membership, 
And over the years, they, they, the standards have changed. Uh, when it first started, you know, you had to do 100% of your work. But now, uh, due to advances in technology, we have machines now that, that, that do a lot of the work for you. But we've got a little splinter group we call the 100 percenters that we are old school. We like to do it all ourselves. Our definition of 100 percenter is somebody that uh, whenever, if I have to stop and go to the bathroom, the knife making process stops. I control every aspect. We're drilling the, the hole for the tang to go into the handle. You know, I have trained a number of knife makers uh, come through the shop. Some of them uh, come in and just want to look and learn a little bit. I've had several that spent a lot of time in the shop. I enjoy teaching people. I enjoy sharing what I, what I learned and what I have learned by trial and error. And yet the knife makers today have so many advantages that I didn't have. You can go on YouTube and see everything from how to grind a blade to heat treat to everything, where to get your hand material. When I started making knives, there was one supplier in the whole country file here that we've, we've Generally you start with, so with bar stock, but I'll profile the blade out. I saw it, the, the steel as you get it is, is annealed, it's soft. And I have a template for that blade which I clamp to the steel, scribe the outline of the knife, cut it out on the metal cutting band saw, and then grind it to the exact shape, and then uh, grind in the bevels, uh, stamp my name and my serial number. All my knives are serial numbered. Number 2301. Uh, then it's ready to heat treat. And uh, heat treating is a uh, very complicated uh, procedure with precise temperatures, uh, cooking time, uh, uh, holding time. But after the heat treat, then you go back to the grinder and you finish grinding the blade, polish it out, and then cut your handles out, uh, attach your handles material to your blade with epoxy and your handle fasteners. And then once it's uh, cured, then you grind the handle to shape, and I, I like to shape them so that they, they feel your hand, feel real good. But after you get it all shaped and polished, then I make the sheath for it. And all my sheaths are made out of eight, nine ounce uh, leather, and I wet form it to that knife and serial number that sheath to match the knife that I make it for. There's a good five or six hours of, of labor in it. Now one of these elaborate knives like, uh, like this right here, uh, you're probably talking about 20 hours work in a knife like this. A lot of hand finishing, uh, a, lot of, a lot of work goes into it. The sheath, a lot of extra work goes into the sheath there. This is the collector type thing. This one will probably never, never cut anything other than the guy that gets careless when he's handling it. My philosophy is you make a knife where it looks so good, you want to pick it up, and then it feels so good in your hand, you don't want to put it down. You're, you're actually taking raw materials and applying your hands and your skill and you're turning it into a, a product that somebody is willing to actually give you money for. I enjoy teaching what I know and different people ask me, well, how much would you charge me to teach me to make knives? And my answer is a standard thing. I don't charge you nothing. All I ask is that you pass this on. You teach somebody else the craft so that this will not die. It's too important a thing to die. Well, a lot of times Miss Alice would get her husband involved in her activity by getting him to create these barnwood frames for her paintings. Now, a lot of these frames still exist, and there's a lot of the frames and paintings here in the museum. And it just goes to show you that you can create art out of anything if you have the frame of mind to do so and the passion. Now, in our last story, we're going to visit with Judy Noble. Judy's going to show us her unique art and the delicate touch that it takes to create art from eggs. <music> I'm Judy Kaler Noble. These are um, just egg artistry, and it is with real eggs. It's not like Easter egg kind of egg artistry. It's not like washi egg, the Japanese style stuff, and it's certainly not like the pisanki. They're more like a Fabergé. 
Faberge eggs. So I got interested in it back in 2002 when I went to California to an art show and I saw them at an art show. I asked somebody if they would teach me how to do them and they were like, nah, we don't feel like it right now. And about a year later they called me up and said they were gonna start classes. It is with real eggs. Yeah, this one is a particular, is, um, is a goose egg. And the one behind me is an ostrich egg. And so I use anything from quail egg all the way up to ostrich egg. I had a friend who was doing the goose eggs. He was raising geese and ducks. So I got a lot from him. But then when Katrina hit, all of his birds got killed or blown away, whatever. So then we ended up not having that as my supplier anymore. But I have found some other goose farms around. The wedding egg is an emu egg. And it was carved on the inside to make a diorama. And on the back side is the carving of the couple and their wedding date below. So this is a period piece of like an 1800s Christmas design. The eggs are very delicate and as you're carving them, I carve them with a special drill. The drill has to turn 400,000 RPMs and a dentist drill turns at 35,000. So it's about 11 times as much as a dentist drill. This one's very special to me because I took the picture. I went around right before Katrina hit and I was taking pictures of items that I thought might not be there after the storm. The lighthouse survived and so I put it onto this egg. This is a little teapot set. It's made with duck eggs. The cup is a duck egg and the teapot itself is a duck egg. The plate is a piece of an ostrich egg. This is a, um, and now this is another thing of Katrina thing got broken, but it's a kaleidoscope and it's a duck egg. This is a goose egg cameo egg. All the rhinestones on each of these cost somewhere around a dollar per inch. A goose egg this size cost about $50 to make. I do do classes. Um, I've taught many people just like I'll be doing today. They show an interest in a certain egg and then I will do a class for it. We're gonna show you how to design or to create this egg, the design that we had. So I created a kit for my students here. Go ahead and open your bags and take out, there should be two bead caps, a clear bead, a silver bead. You'll have a pin and a jump ring. What I want to do is start with this large bead cap, okay. and we're going to put it over top of the hole on that egg. In just a minute, we're going to glue it all together with five minute epoxy and an equal drop of the resin. All right, go ahead and pull your picture out of your sleeve and set your picture up against your egg. See how it's going to fit. Take the Mod Podge and you're gonna dip it in and just lay it, glue onto the egg. All right, now we're gonna put the picture onto it. Once you've got it on there, you wanna roll it out and roll out all of the um, bubbles and glue. At this point, we're gonna add the cord and I'm gonna use a quick grabbing glue. Okay, so I put it on the edge? Right along the edge of the picture. The next thing we're going to go to is using the um, disappearing ink. As I um, cover over the glue, the glue is going to start disappearing. Take the cord and lay in the cord on that glue line. All right, we've got the all, we've got the Mod Podge on here. I'm going to take the white um, Ultra Fine and I'm going to sprinkle it everywhere I've got the Mod Podge. We are ready to add the topper and the bottom part. Woo! I'm done. He finally finished before I did. I finally finished before you. I don't often sell them because 
for the time it takes to make them and as much as I put into them. Trying to get your money out of it, you don't. So they're mostly just gifts that I give away. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. If you'd like information about anything you've seen, contact us at mpbonline.org slash Mississippi Roads or like our Mississippi Public Broadcasting Facebook page. Till next time, I'm Walt Grayson. I'll be seeing you on Mississippi Roads. Mississippi Roads is made possible in part by the generous support of viewers like you. Thank you.